Great. Well, thanks. And uh, again, I want to welcome uh, you all. And uh, thanks to James um, for um, hosting the session tonight. It's all yours, James. Thank you. Thank you. And um, welcome, everybody. Um, so active flying. Uh, active flying is something that it's a term a lot of people toss around. And I rarely hear it talked about very well or very clearly. And uh, I think it's really important. So let, let me start with that question. What, what do you guys think active flying is? What would you say about it? And try not to all talk at once. Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in here into the, into the void. Um, for me, it means, you know, feeling what the wing is doing, um, trying to keep um, even pressure um, on, on my brake toggles um, to kind of absorb any, any turbulence that might be going on. Um, so I think that's, for me, that's a big part of it. I'm sure there's a lot more. Okay, that's, that's, that's good. Yeah, James, well, I, I, for me, it's keeping the wing where I want it to be, you know, which is usually overhead or slight to the side or something. It's like doing whatever's necessary to keep my <clears throat> wing flying in the place that I want it to be. Okay. Um, and how do you decide where you want it to be? Well, that depends on what I'm doing. I mean, if I'm if I'm thermaling, you know, <clears throat> I may want it banked. If I'm doing wing overs, you know, I may want it to be moving around in a certain spot. But you know, it's it's usually I want it I want it to be a wing, not a, a ball of fabric, and and you know, I want it to be positioned. I don't want it back on me or in front of me if I don't want it there. I want it right where it happens to be. Okay, I like that. Um, to me, I, I think of active, and you could say that it's that it's about motion, so you're not being static, and that's part of it. Because if I'm just frozen, if I'm static, I'm not going to be responding to anything. But I think it's it's more than just moving, because I'm not just doing this. I'm actually being alive, like you guys said, and I'm responding to what's going on. If the air were static, if the air, if I was just on a 6 a.m. sled ride in every flight, I really wouldn't have to do any active flying at all except to launch and land. And of course, that's not the air that we usually fly in or like to fly in. So um, uh, I think you, you kind of, hit it, both of you, with the idea that it's about being alive and responsive to what's happening so that you can help the glider uh, do what you want, and in particular, to stay inflated. That's a big part of it. Um, so I have this model here. <clears throat> and of course, when you're flying along, it normally looks like this, but except we don't have this big, heavy wire that keeps it inflated. So if I take the wire away, then we can talk about what, what happens when we run into some turbulence. So when turbulence wants to deflate us, what it's trying to do is take the angle of attack negative. So it's trying to fold down one side or the entire paraglider sometimes. And if we don't do anything, or sometimes even if we do, it will fold the leading edge down. And then pretty soon we've got the whole side of the wing hanging down and it might be 10% or it might be 80%, but it kind of looks like that either way, just a bigger piece hanging down. So one clue that that's, that that's happening is that my brake line tension on that side will get light or go to zero. And I like to talk about tension rather than pressure. There's pressure in the wing, but Brake line tension doesn't correlate very reliably to the pressure that's in the wing. And it's really tension on the line that I have some connection to. So, um, so I'm gonna, you, you'll hear me talk about tension even though you'll hear a lot of other people use the term pressure. It's really the, the same idea. Um, when the glider starts to fold down, if I pull on the brake fan, 
I'm pulling down the entire back part of the wing. There are a whole lot of lines. I've got one brake line in my hand. Oh, I forgot to introduce the pilot. That's obviously Pete Williams, who's a, volunteered for this job. Um, and I've got one brake line in my hand, but it's connected to this whole fan of lines on the back of the glider. So when it starts to fold down in the front, if I notice and I bring my hand down, I can bring down the back of the glider and I can potentially keep the angle of attack positive, or at least it doesn't go so dramatically negative while the air is trying to, trying to deflate me. So one question then is, how big of a hand move am I making? Who's got an idea about that? Enough to keep the tension to where it was before? Enough to find where the tension is. So that's exactly right. So if it's a little tip collapse, then, or, or just a little movement of the glider, it might be a movement this big with my hand. But if I'm really hit a hit an air shark, a bad piece of air, my hand might need to go down below my butt. So don't don't hold a fixed idea in your mind about how big the move is. It's whatever is necessary. As long as there's no tension, my hand keeps going down until I find tension again. As soon as I find it, then my hand comes right back up, and that's how I don't spin. If I hold my hand down, I'm going to spin. If I hold both hands down, I'm going to stall. And that'll happen on an advanced glider, that'll happen pretty quickly. Um, so, um, but, but how big the move is, there's no, there's no rule. And you can make a huge move even with both hands, as long as you don't hold your hands there. So be willing to make a big move when that's what's needed to find the tension on the line again. And wh what you're doing, of course, is Let's see if I can keep the orientation I have on the glider. So the leading edge folds this way, and you're bringing down the trailing edge so that it doesn't look like that. It's not a negative angle of attack. And you want to always be ready for that to happen. So even if you're just flying along, you have a little bit of tension on the brake lines just so that you can feel what's happening. And Think of yourself as a martial artist. A martial artist doesn't look like much walking down the street. He probably has good posture, but he doesn't look like a fighter. But if you try to hit him, you won't be able to. That's because a martial artist is always ready to respond. And so that's kind of your disposition. What you want to get yourself trained into is it's not that you're like this all the time, because um, it's hard to fly that way and have any fun, but you want to, by flying with a lot of attention for a while, you learn, you train your body to uh, be responsive, to be ready all the time. And then you can relax even um, when the air is not very nice because your, your body's responding as it needs to. And you only... Um, have your breath suck in when you actually have a big collapse or something. So sometimes you won't be able to catch a collapse, um, but almost all collapses can be caught if you're if you're alive to it and you let your hand move as far as necessary. And if you can't quite catch it, then you'll at least reduce its its severity and make it smaller by responding in a timely way. So anybody got a question or a thought so far? How much is that on an A-wing or a low B? I mean, how much get, is how much of a collapse, the possibility of a collapse like that on an A or a B wing compared to you know a higher class wing? Are we gonna well, still be able to have to go so deep to recover it, or should it because it's an A-wing or a B wing? should automatically open up? Well, what we're talking about is preventing the collapse in the first place. So, oh. um, and how big that move is will depend on what the air is doing and what the air is doing to your glider. And so, yes, on an A-wing, it could still be down to your butt. It's less likely. A-wings have a higher angle of attack and they're just built to be more solid. Um, but they still go when the air is is 
is sufficient, and they actually go with less warning. Um, an advanced glider is constantly talking to you, and it will maybe start to get light just slightly earlier. A quarter of a second is enough to make it easier to respond. Um, whereas an A-wing may just go blam and disappear, and you, it, it can be harder to respond on an A-wing. Um, probably by the time you're flying in, in much thermal turbulence, you're at least on a B-wing of some kind, and those, those are better. Um, um, so, but yes, the, uh, it, in the, in the, in the, in the wrong air or the right air in the wrong air, um, any wing can, can need a, a move down to your butt to prevent the collapse. So again, what we're really trying to do with our active flying on the brakes, which is true when we're climbing also, uh, is we're trying to prevent all the collapses and we should start each flight with the disposition that. I'm going to prevent all the collapses today. And once in a while, there'll be one you can't prevent. Either you're too slow, hopefully you'll train yourself up to where you're quicker, um, and you can train yourself up and you should have optimism wherever you are right now. Realize you, you can become better with practice. And by giving this, this attention to tension, uh, uh, a lot uh, as a good part of your flying for a while, you will become better. You will prevent more collapses. And if, if something happens that you couldn't catch, well, okay, that will happen occasionally. Uh, James? Yeah. So if, if, I, if we are striving to become better, you know, idealistic, uh, perfect, none of us are going to be perfect, but then what I hear you saying is that any collapse that I have was a, a failure on my part and I should reflect on that and you know make a, a mental note to what led up to it and self-improve that you know that in a sense every collapse was preventable. I didn't prevent it, so therefore it, it's highlighting a shortcoming in my act of flying. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that it's that's a little harsh, but it's basically correct. If, if one is so dramatic that you couldn't catch it, then it's um, or that it couldn't have been caught, that's going to be a pretty wild event. Um, those do happen, um, especially if you're flying in strong thermal turbulence or if you're in the Alps or something. Um, but um, generally, yes, if 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 one if a collapse happens you should have the idea, oh, I could have caught that. Why didn't I? How could I have done it better? So here's something that you can use. Um, one of the, And this was a huge help to me as I was trying to get better at this. And I'm, I still every day tr use this and, and uh, try to keep improving. But the um, if I'm flying along or it's, let's say I'm in a climb, if I hold my hands still, then my body kind of gets static. And as soon as I get static, now I'm not, it's, I'm not very responsive. So one way to, to cultivate looseness is just to keep my hands moving. And it can be very small, like a quarter of an inch, maybe start with an inch, or if you have a long travel glider, like an A or B wing, it could be a couple inches. So just while you're flying, doesn't matter exactly how, just keep your hands moving all the time. And if that gets boring or tedious, make it, okay, for the next 15 minutes, I'm just gonna keep my hands moving all the time. Or while I'm climbing today, or just in this one climb, do something that works for you and doesn't take the fun out of your flying. But, but if I just keep my hands moving all the time, now I can't become static. And that helps me feel, and that has, in, in my experience, that has helped me train my body and my arms and my hands and my nervous system to be alive with small changes in tension or changes that happen very quickly. And- Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but then if you, if you are moving your hands all the time, don't you lose efficiency of the glide? Don't you want to, to and especially when you are thermaling, don't you want to try to be 
the the more steady possible so you know you know you're not having any pendulum and so i i know what you're saying but i i think that you can still be a little bit more static and still be active what do you think well um i i, I think your point's a good one you don't want to be penduluming while you're thermaling uh that's going to make you inefficient and you'll lose altitude but um if you're finding that you're penduluming reduce the size of your motions again it can literally be a quarter of an inch flying boomerangs i was often moving just like a quarter of an inch quarter half an inch but um uh, so i wasn't generating crazy movements of the glider i'm just like enough and and it's still you're still making adjustments like okay i'm i'm turning a little tighter so i pull a little more inside brake a little less outside brake whatever adjustments i'm making it's just that while i'm doing it i'm just keeping my hands moving and and when i get to a, what might be a static place where i could hold steady for a little bit just try to not hold steady and again don't do it all the time don't don't make it tedious but um but pick sections of your flight where you're going to do this and i think you'll find that it helps your your nervous system stay alive with what's going on um okay what else who's, who's got a thought or a question i'm curious about um looking at the wing and if people find that looking at the wing helps them better understand the feeling that the wing is giving them or if that's just a distraction from feeling the wing that's a great one and you'll you'll hear extremely polarized opinions about this um uh you'll hear people say you should never look at the wing that you should be able to feel it and you need to keep your horizon reference and that that's the most important thing um a small number of people look up a lot while they're climbing and yeah you want to still keep aware of the other gliders around you and so on um and well one of those people is russ ogden um and whenever anything's going on in russ's paraglider he's watching it so russ won the super final recently he's the lead test pilot for ozone he's won a lot of competitions and he has said, when I get scared in a paraglider, I'm like this. So my own feeling is I look at it a lot. But I look at it mainly when I think something's going on, when I can feel the air is not nice and I think it might blow away, um, I'll be watching it because if it does blow away, it's much better to know what just happened than to be guessing about it. The only time I've thrown my reserve on a comp wing, I, I was guessing because I wasn't watching it. It was a total surprise what happened and I thought it was a big asymmetric and a big asymmetric when it restarts it restarts with a little bit of the flying side with a, with, a, with a little bit of it still flying and that since there's not very much of it it doesn't surge too hard so you can wait for it and break it so it doesn't get past the horizon and frontal in fact if you have a huge collapse It's really important to wait for it because it'll be back here. So I'm flying along and, and I get this huge collapse, especially if I was on bar. What's the first thing that happens? Well, the glider just slowed down a lot because it got this huge draggy thing hanging down when a minute ago it was a nice clean paraglider. So the glider slows down. That means I'm going to swing forward underneath it or Pete Williams is going to swing forward underneath it. And that means that the, the the part that's still flying is highly loaded, but there's not much there. And if I pull a brake right then, I'm really likely to spin that part and it'll go, it'll spin that way. And with this huge collapse already happening, things get very exciting if you do that. So you want to wait and let it surge and um and then break it gently so that you're not stalling it, but it's it's flying down and, and if your collapse side isn't stuck, if it's not cravatted, the collapse side will just reinflate while you're 
flying toward the ground, then in a moment you'll be reinflated and you'll just exit and be okay. So that's what I thought I was dealing with in this case. And in fact, um, I don't really know what happened, but when it surged, it surged so hard that even though I was I had both hands to here, I still got flicked and then a lot of other stuff happened. Um, I wrote a uh, piece about it that ran in cross country, which I can share in a follow-up email um, where you can read my thoughts about what actually happened. But um, so it's really good to look at it. Um, and if you think the air is weird, watch what's going on. And that can also be a bit reassuring because in a lot of turbulence, the quieter is not really moving that much. Like it's moving a little bit, maybe it'll yaw a little bit. Sometimes they do that. And you just don't have to worry about that. If it's yawing a little bit, you don't have to catch every little yaw movement, a little bit of forward and backward movement in, during a climb isn't something you have to worry about. But, um, um, and so watching it, you, can help you see that the, the movement that you're feeling in the harness that's alarming, it seems alarming, it's not really a big movement of the glider. Another thing that can help on a day like that is if you look at the people around you, maybe in the same thermal or flying nearby, and, and they're in the same air. And if their glider isn't doing this, well, yours probably isn't either. It, it doesn't take much to feel like to like an unnerving amount of stuff is going on. So um, yes, I think looking at it's a good idea. It's true that you need to keep some horizon reference, especially in a recovery when, when something's happening, but I've mostly not found that to be an issue. Like I, you, in a recovery, usually something's diving, surging, and you can see the horizon, the gliders this far below the horizon or this far below the horizon or wherever it is. Um, I don't think losing the horizon reference is usually a big problem. James, at what point in time do you transition from, I'm, I'm pulling brake to see where I find the tension again and admitting, okay, this wing is gone, it's collapsed and I probably should stop breaking it. Um, that's a great question. So, um, if you get down to your butt and you don't find anything, then you can figure your glider is hanging down like, like the one behind me. Um, and then you can look up and see that it's hanging down. And, um, and unless it's surging, again, you, you want to avoid breaking it right away for the reason I just mentioned, because part of it's probably still flying. And even if the right risers just hit you on the leg, Okay, that's a big collapse, but you might still have 20 or 30% of your glider flying on the other side. You don't want to stall that part. The recovery gets a lot harder if you do that um, and may become impossible. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, but, but if you're not finding anything, as, as soon as you can, look up. And, and if you don't see anything, then the whole thing's gone behind you. That's a case like what I what happened to me in Switzerland, I if I had responded, like, oh, I don't know what's going on, instead of with this idea that I, I knew what was going on that turned out to be wrong, then what I would have done was I would have settled into a full stall position. And I would have come swung back under the glider in a full stall, which is a circumstance I know how to manage. And once that settled down, I could, I could exit that and fly away. And that's not what I did. And it was because I had a preconceived thought about what was happening. So um, I actually have another story like that, which is about another reserve throw. Reserve throws are very instructive. Um, sometimes something unexpected will happen and you'll be tempted to go, oh, that did not just happen. Like to have a moment of denial like that. And you might even say that to yourself in your head um, or out loud. And I wanna encourage you not to have those moments. Whatever just happened is what happened. Now deal with it, do it now. Don't say that 
because that gives time for the next thing to happen, which you then might not be able to recover. And what happened to me was I was, um, this was a long time ago, I was, I was flying a DHV2 wing in an SIV clinic. And I went to do a spin, but I had a lot of weight shift in when I tried to spin. And gliders, it's hard to spin toward the weight shift. And so what I did was I started a turn and I got into a, a steep bank turn, pulling a crazy amount of brake with lots of weight shift. And all of a sudden it spun really fast. Well, that turns out to be an acro move called an ass chopper. I'd had no idea at the time. So I had just done my first ass chopper. And of course, I didn't know how to keep up with it. So I had now two riser twists. So now the glider stops flying and goes overhead. I've got two riser twists and for a moment I'm parachutal. And, and I said, oh, that did not just happen. Well, what happened then was the glider surged past the horizon, frontal, took a cravat on one side and I went into a, a, a sat because I had so much weight shift locked into the twists. Now I'm in a sat and I could have prevented that if I had just reached up and grabbed some rear lines above the twist to reduce the surge, just to damp the surge enough so that it didn't go past the horizon and frontal. That would have been all I had to do because then once it surged and I caught it that much, now it'll come overhead. Sure, I'm twisted and it's trying to turn, but I can untwist two twists pretty quickly if I'm in some kind of normal flight mode. So in that moment, I gave away my chance to, to fix it, to fix it easily. And I did it by saying, oh, that did not just happen. So that was 2006. Since then, I've tried really hard not to ever use those words and just to be alive to whatever actually did happen, just to finish that story. So I'm in a sat, I'm aware that it's a sat, and I know it's bad to throw your reserve in a sat if you can avoid it because it tends to go over and stick to the wing. And you've all seen those videos. So I'm trying to figure out what to do. I have a little bit of altitude and I made a violent weight shift and forced out some of the weight shift through the twist, which you won't always be able to do. Twists can be really tight. It was enough to shred the sheaths on some A-lines and so on. And, did some damage to the glider, but it got the glider to exit the sat. And then it did one turn in a spiral, and then it exited the spiral, and then it did a loop. And, and, and I'm along for the ride because I've got two riser twists. So um, when, it's starting, when I'm starting to go up for the loop, I, it's not very energetic. I'm not sure the lines are gonna stay tight all the way over. So I threw my reserve on the way up. And then the lines did stay tight, which was too bad because now my reserve is out. So I went into the lake, but, um, but all of that could have been prevented if I was just not in denial about what was actually happening. Uh, James? Yeah, Tom. Uh, you've talked a lot about using brakes uh, for active flying. <clears throat> To what degree does weight shift come into play? That's a great question. Um, so if active flying is about being present to everything that's happening with my glider, um, part of that is what's happening with the harness. And um, you're probably used to weight shifting toward the turn when you're climbing, and that's good. Um, but the sort of rule of thumb I like for for weight shift in the harness is when the glider asks you for something, give it to it. So it'll it'll rock and it'll it'll feel like, oh, my left butt cheek's got nothing. Okay, let your weight shift go to there. That helps that side stay inflated and then rock back into your weight shift. So um, if you watch like Brett Hazlitt videos, he's flying a boomerang. He's always moving like this. And that's what flying a boomerang is like. It's just constant movement. So it'll be less strenuous on most gliders, but the same principle applies. If the glider asks you for something, give it to it. 
And so along the same lines um, there, James, um, so some wings have, um, they call them ACRs, active control risers. And, and I guess, you know, just flying with, with the risers rather than your brakes. Um, how, does, how does that factor into what you're talking about? Is it all pretty much the same situation or, or you got, you know, you're also pulling on C's and, and I don't know if the ACR is also pulling down on the B's, but yeah. That's a great question. Um, so what the ACRs are trying to do is simulate a two-liner. And so I'll talk about two-liners for a minute. So if, if that's my wing and this is the leading edge over here, and that's the A riser and the B risers are back here. Um, when I'm pulling on the B risers on a two-liner and, and on a two-liner, you're either on the B risers or you're on the brakes and one of the two all the time. And that lets you active fly on full bar. And the reason it works to fly on the B risers is because with only two risers, everything's pivoting around the A riser. So if, if I pull on the B risers, I'm, I'm pivoting the whole profile mm -hmm. like that. So if I feel it's starting to deflate, I can tilt the whole profile. The shape is different than on the brakes. The brakes curl the trailing edge more. And on the B risers, I'm not changing the shape like that. I'm not folding down the trailing edge. I'm just tilting the whole profile, which tilts around the A riser attachment point. So what the what the uh, the some of the more recent C wings have is this linkage, which is trying to simulate that by pulling on the C's and the B's in some coordinated way to still tilt the profile and do the same thing. And that would let you fly actively on the, um, um, on, on the rear risers. Um, the reports I've heard from uh, only one competition pilot who's flown a glider like that uh, is it doesn't work very well, but he's used to two liners, many years of flying two liners. So, um, so he may be a little spoiled. Um, I haven't flown one myself. I'm really intrigued by the idea because once you get used to having B risers and being able to fly actively on half bar or full bar, it's really hard to go back to flying on full bar without that ability. Um, it just feels scary. Um, if you're flying, so so I think those those things are a good idea if you don't want to get a two liner. I think we will see sea gliders that are two liners before long. Um, and they're worth considering just for the active flying advantage, but I don't know what else, you know, obviously it depends how, how they are in other ways. If you're flying on a three liner without, um, without a linkage like that, then if you pull down the rear risers, you're changing the shape of the profile, but you're not tilting it in the same way. So some, um, some gliders like that more or less. I, I don't think you can fly too effectively, active fly too effectively. You can steer on the rear risers. So if you're on full bar and you just want to be able to steer where you're going, I think the rear risers are good for that. I think you can feel with the rear risers. You can just deflect them slightly so you can feel tension. If you feel that tension going away, well, that's a good time to back off with your foot. Um, and you can do a lot of active flying with your foot on the speed bar. Um, and if you're on speed bar and, you, and you're not on a two liner or an ACR glider, then you should always be thinking about flying actively with your foot. Just don't just park it out there, but feel what's going on with the glider. When the glider starts to surge, I back off with my foot to slow it down. When it goes behind me, I push more. And so I'm constantly alive with my foot in the same way that I'm alive with the brakes when I'm climbing or flying at trim. But James? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, James? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I had two, two comments about what you uh, recently said there. Uh, my last two gliders uh, are you know, ACR gliders, the Bonanza 2 and the Arctic 6, and <clears throat> sort of uh, giving you some feedback on that. 
I find it useful, but it, it takes so much force <clears throat> that I, I don't feel like I can react fast enough. It's almost like uh, you said with the, the speed bar, it's sort of, I feel about that amount of speed. I can come off the speed bar, but I, I'm not very fast. So if, if things need to happen quickly uh, with, with those last two gliders, I, I feel like I, I kind of get a little bit delayed. Uh, and then <clears throat> the, the second uh, comment was uh, how, a little bit tongue in cheek, but how do you manage all this stuff? If you're, let's say you're on glide and you're riding the, the speed bar and you're modulating a little bit, you're trying to feel the glider uh, through the rear risers. How do, you, how do you make the decision of like, oh, I should come off the bar or I should pull down on the rear risers? How, how do you make the judgment call on how to control you? you where if you're just on the brakes, well, <clears throat> you have weight shift and brakes. But now if you're on the rear risers, you can do rear risers, you come off the speed bar, maybe a little weight shift. How do you figure out what to do in real time? Great question. So uh, the first one on, on, the, uh, on your ACR gliders, what are you doing to tell what's going on when you're, when you're flying on bar with the riser linkage set up? Uh, <clears throat> The way they they describe it is what I what I try to do. You know, have some pressure on it so you can feel it, and I can feel it. You know, and I can catch small things, but it, it may be because it takes so much force. You know, I'm almost kind of picking myself up out of the harness a little bit to to make it happen, and so I don't have sort of the delicacy about it. Okay, that makes sense because if you're if you're actually pulling down for a long time, you're just gonna get worn out and your muscles aren't gonna have that sensitivity. So I have something you can use because some gliders are really heavy on the bees. Some, some uh, two-liners are, are really heavy on the bees also. The leopard's like that, much heavier than the boomerang. It's just hard work. I, the, the handles on the leopard, I wrapped surgical tubing around to make them this big. So I had a larger diameter thing to hold on to just because it's so heavy. But Instead of thinking about pulling down, think about pulling them back. Because if I pull back just slightly, like an inch, that's, that doesn't change my profile. It doesn't change my top speed measurably, but it's enough that I can feel changes in tension without doing a pull up all day. So just pull back a little bit. Now you can feel the, the tension. And if something's really going away, then you can do one pull up and you'll be strong enough because you haven't been doing it for the last five minutes. Does that make sense? So, yes. okay. So that's, that's something that can probably be helpful with that, that I use every day. Um, it's how I feel the bees on a two liner. And um, your other question is how do you know when to back off or when to do something else? And well, if you get scared shitless back off the bar, um, that's a good rule number one. <laughs> um, generally, your glider can go through more turbulence on full bar than you think. Um, so something you can practice with as long as your reserve drift isn't onto a town or the Hudson River um, is try to stay on the bar, at least half bar through things that feel a little uncomfortable to you. And if the glider moves forward, back off. If the glider moves back, push a little more. Try to keep it kind of evenly over, overhead. Try to keep your foot alive to the tension, but it's hard to feel tension with such big muscles as your legs. So what you'll feel more is the glider moving. You can tell that from what's going on in the harness. Um, so, it's good to, to fly on bar a lot. Most transitions from thermal to thermal, you should be on at least half bar. Um, if it's into wind, especially. So if you're not used to flying on bar, or if you're used to not flying on bar, try to practice it. Um, practice flying with a third, and this, I don't think this applies to you, Tom, but for 
others in the group who might not be used to the speed bar yet, try to have it be a normal part of your repertoire as opposed to an exotic thing that you only push when you're backed into a canyon. <laughs> you know, if, you don't want it to be an emergency only thing because then you're in an emergency and it's the second time you've ever used it. It should be a familiar thing that you understand and that you use all the time. So um, if you're new to it, practice flying on a third to half bar. The difference in collapses between breaks and, and half bar is not that great. Um, if something were to happen, you're not setting yourself up for an incredibly wild ride. And if, if, uh, if things get turbulent, just drop it and get on the brakes and be ready to, to deal with, with whatever. But um, gliders are a lot more solid, especially modern gliders are a lot more solid on bar uh, than it, we imagine. Um, so if, once you've experimented with it a bit, then try, okay, I'm going to keep it now through some turbulence. If it gets a little bumpy, I'm just going to keep my foot there. And incidentally, when you're considering how much bar you, you're, you're applying, it has nothing to do with where your foot is because that's about how your connection is set up and whether you've made it tighten up and so on. Watch the pulleys. And when the pulleys have moved halfway to touching, that's half bar. So that might be most of the way out with your foot if your speed bar lines are loose. Okay, so then you might wanna make an adjustment. You've all heard instructors say you've got to adjust it. Okay, whatever, but um, watch the pulleys to, to see how, how much bar you're actually on. Full bar is when the pulleys are touching. It doesn't matter what's going on with your foot. Um, uh, and beyond that, beyond just getting scared, if you take some collapses on bar, which is on, on a C-wing or below, it's not necessarily that big a deal. Um, it'll seem unnerving at first, but um, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find that your glider tends to recover if you just get off the bar and don't do anything too dramatic will almost always recover just fine. And then you can push some more bar again and keep going. Um, so it helps to get a little bit of experience of things happening to have that confidence. Um, but you will get that confidence because it's not usually too dramatic. Uh, James, what, uh, one question I had uh, was related to the, to the previous one. It, you, you fly two liners, so you're, you're on glide. Uh, and you've got some bar on, how do you make the decision? Am I going to try to control this with bar or am I going to try to control this with the rear risers? How, how, do, you, how do you balance or move between those two ways of controlling the glider? Yeah, there isn't a rule about that. Um, you can do basically everything, including recoveries on the rear risers. Um, if you have to do a big recovery, it's good to get off the bar just so the glider slows down and is less wild to deal with. Um, on the Leopard, I use both I, because it's just so, the tension is so high to pull the bees. Um, it's just easier to back my foot off halfway and um, not do all of it with the bees, but you can really do all of it with the bees. And um, Torsten Siegel, one of Jin's designers told me on the Boom 11, you can really recover basically everything without going to the brakes, just on the bees. Of course, Torsten's a pretty good pilot. Did that answer your question? Ah, uh, yes, thanks. James, if, as you said, you're, you're on bar, let's say you're on full bar and you hit some air you don't like, and you just jump off the bar. Um, I, my interpretation is your angle of attack increases. So if, if anything, you know, the, the chances of collapse go down. So it's, it's, there's nothing bad about just, you know, dramatically jumping off the bar, correct? No, I don't think there's, there's any risk to that. It's, uh, it can be dramatically slow if you're racing, but, um, because you're 
you're you're you're flying along and you drop the bar and you'll swing like that and so you'll you'll do a pendulum and and you'll lose some altitude but and but I, you're, I, it's hard to imagine a bad consequence in terms of something further happening. Um, but try just backing off halfway. I mean, if, it, if the glider hasn't collapsed yet, um, try just backing off halfway. And part of this is, a, is, again, training your nervous system. It's hard to be confident of the glider on bar because you don't have the brakes that you're used to that we all learned with at the beginning. And holy cow, so what, you know, it, it feels like something's happening. Um, one of the things that's surprising um, that I learned from a British aerodynamicist who's, who races paragliders, um, Adrian Thomas, you guys may have read some things by him, um, is you're not necessarily more likely to have a collapse on bar than you are flying at trim. Because if you, if, if you consider, um, let's say some, some turbulence is coming this way, your glider is flying along. Well, if I'm flying faster, the effective angle of this turbulence is more like this because I'm moving through it faster. So the apparent wind, if you will, if you're a sailor, it isn't here, it's here. Whereas if I'm going slower at trim, it's here. So it has, it, it's, it arguably cancels out to some extent, whether you're on bar, as far as the, the probability of a collapse. You're not more likely to have a collapse on bar. The difference is if you're on full bar and you have a big collapse, what happens is more dramatic, um, but you're not more likely to have a collapse. So what else? Um, <clears throat> talking about, about videos, when, when you're watching videos and you're, you're wondering what's going on, it's, um, it's, you can watch people's hands. Sometimes you can see hands pretty well, but the, the thing I like to watch to see what people are doing is the trailing edge of the glider. So if I see the trailing edge of the glider deflect, I know he's moved his hands. Um, if it doesn't deflect, it doesn't matter what it, he's doing this way, he hasn't done anything. So, um, and if, if a collapse is starting, and you and he and he and like it's starting like this. Maybe I've got the video in slow motion. If he's doing the right things, he'll be moving down, and then I'll see the back of the glider go like that, and then maybe he'll catch it. But it, if he doesn't do anything, the trailing edge will just stay where it is, and the glider will just collapse. So you can learn a lot watching the trailing edge in videos. Um, let's see. One time that. I think active flying is important for safety, even beyond just preventing unnecessary collapses in reserve rides generally, is right at launch. When I launch, as we've seen, there's often gusty, funny things happening at launch, especially if it's a steeper launch. And so often there'll be, let's see if I can get my hand right. There, I'm launching going this way, you'll see people get a pendulum. They'll, they'll just kind of elevate her up like this and then it'll stop and the glider will surge. That's a surge you really want to break. And a lot of people don't because, maybe because they're holding the idea that, okay, my glider just started flying. I don't want to, I don't want to break it yet. But if it's surging there, you want to break it. Not very long. Again, all these moves are short in terms of duration. You're not bringing your hands down and holding them. Um, but when it surges like that, you want to catch it. That's a place where you, you want to keep it overhead. Be and the reason is that's a classic launch accident. You, you, there's a pendulum and then it surges, one side collapses, glider turns toward the hill and the person crashes. So, and those crashes can be terrible. So, um, uh, if you get a pendulum, you'll be aware of getting elevated be expecting that surge, be ready for it, and just break it enough so that it doesn't get very far. You don't have to keep it frozen overhead, and that's a good idea to lose. Some people coach, oh, you got to keep it overhead. No, you want it to be flying. You don't want it to, 
um, you don't want to argue too much with it when it's trying to get flying, but, and when it's surging, it's always trying to get flying again. So don't try to force it to stay right there. Let it surge, but don't let it come to here because there's turbulence or you wouldn't have had that elevator. And that's a place where you, you, you can't really afford to take a, an asymmetric of much size. At Ellenville, there, especially on the West launch, some, sometimes you'll take off and just as you're like lifting up above the trees, something will try to deflate you on one side or the other. So you be alive to active flying as soon as you're in the air, feel that tension. If the tension is going away, it doesn't matter if you're 20 feet above the hill or 2000 feet above the hill, the tension is going away, you bring your hand down until you find it and you can save your bacon that way. Um, when you catch one, often you'll hear a crack or a thwap sort of thing. And that what that means is it was starting to, to fold and you caught it and then bam, it just sort of snapped open again. Um, good job. One question, the other end of the, the, other end of the flight, um, landing. When you get into a hot landing zone, I always feel a little more reluctant to do a lot of active flying when I'm when I'm close to the ground, you know, because there's less margin. It feels like so. I wasn't sure. Like, do you change your approach to active uh, flying as you're coming in if you're if you're getting a lot of turbulence or if you get a, you know, one of those unhelpful, you know, uh, bumps right as you're setting up. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think landing is a, is a time where you don't have room to throw your reserve um, usually. So that's a time to be particularly alive with active flying. And you, you don't want to be like doing wingovers or something, but you really want to be responding to everything. And so, yeah, all the stuff we've been talking about of finding the tension, being quick about it. Um, um, there are times when um, landings on a cross country flight can be quite wild toward the end of the day. There's a, there's a thing, I'm remembering one in particular uh, from, from Yamaska and, and uh, Quebec. Um, the, it was a practice day for the Canadian nationals a while back. And um, I was flying with Brett Hazlitt and we landed in different fields, but we were in a place where the terrain ran downhill downwind. And so the, the air, the, the cooling air in the afternoon can just start to tumble. And um, we, we both had what we call full combat all the way to the ground. It's like huge things trying to happen. We're trying to keep the glider from doing very much, but, we're, but that takes lots of big hand movements and just being alive. I mean, it's kind of crazy um, just how much motion that can be. And, and that can happen close to the ground on a day when it hasn't been like that up in the air or late in the day, like that flight, that was almost sunset. Um, it had gotten pretty smooth up higher and we just couldn't find any more thermals. Of course, day was over, but because of this down, down slope flow, um, it was really rowdy near the ground. So um, yeah, and I should mention Ellenville one, once more. Most of you have heard me talk like a broken record about Ellenville, but Ellenville is really unpredictable. And I think actually, it's usually when it's got some north in it. And that means it's got downslope flow from the Catskills. That's my theory for why it gets so crazy there and why you can get a super adiabatic layer near the ground at noon on an otherwise nice sort of stable day that doesn't have much going on. And you can get a dustless dust devil. Um, obviously those are bad because you can't see them. So anytime you're coming into land in Ellenville, you should be fully on your game, 100%. Really, anytime you're coming into land anywhere, 
pretend it's Ellenville and just be 100% alive, 100% on your game, be ready for whatever and let your hands do their thing that you've been training yourself to do uh, higher in the air. Um, and that will save your bacon uh, if, you, if you're landing in a place where it might be downslope like that, um, or if you're landing at Ellenville at noon on a seemingly calm day or 11 o'clock in the morning. Ellenville is kind of spooky. It really, uh, it looks like a country club and there is a country club right over there. Um, but Ellenville merits the same respect you'd give the Owens Valley, in my opinion. I heard Arthur refer to that country club as Chernobyl and he would have known. So the Ellenville Country Club there where the, not, not the actual golf course, but the, um, the resort. So Arthur landed in there one time and had to walk out and he said it was just like Chernobyl. What does and that I mean? I don't know. Was it radioactive? <laughs> Arthur, what can I say? It was does radioactive. Arthur carry a Geiger counter? I think so. But <laughs> I've had that experience also landing um, on like glass off evenings where you know that there's going to be a, a shear layer somewhere in there because you've been, you know, cruising the ridge in the glass off where it's been strong enough to maintain and you're looking at the landing zone and everything is dead. You know, it's just hanging dead. So, you know, something's coming. So, and those are some of the most exciting moments that I've had just coming down from like three hours of mellow into this shear layer and whoop, everything goes off. And is that a, what, what, what site? We I've had that at Ellenville. I've had that at Brace. I've had that at Rutland, like anywhere where we have this sort of shear. I think it happens as, as the layer cake is setting up for the evening, you know, you're getting like smooth, steady winds up above that you've been soaring in. And then the, this really dead calm below. And sometimes it's a smooth gradient, but a lot of times there's a hard line in there. Um, and then things just go wacky. That's a great point. Um, uh, if you notice a shear layer at 100 feet or 200 feet when you're sort of setting up your landing, get very alive because underneath that it may be different. The wind direction may be different. Um, I actually landed a landed a tandem downwind into a giant nettle patch in France one time because I had this idea in my head about the wind direction. And it was late in the day and it was just switching from adiabatic to catabatic. It was just switching to blowing down. But at 200 feet, it was still blowing up. So I, I'm setting up as if. And, and I went through a shear layer where, whoa, everything's wobbling, something's something's funny, but then it smoothed out. But I didn't notice that underneath that, the wind was blowing the opposite direction. And so I got all set up and now my ground speed's like, holy shit. So we're over flying and there's this garden wall coming. Mm -hmm. And I, I surfed my passenger right into a giant nettle patch. It was, we didn't hit anything, everybody was okay. But she thought for a second she had broken her leg because it stung so badly. <laughs> All right, I can only tell that story because the statute of limitations has expired. Um, so yeah, um, a clue a clue to a shear layer is as you're getting lower, like a couple hundred feet or a hundred feet or um, anywhere in there, suddenly it feels weird. Like it's been smooth, like Zoe said, glass off. Suddenly it feels weird. The glider's doing whoa. And then it'll probably get better, but it may be turbulent under that. The wind may be a different direction. Double check the wind direction. Late in the day, always keep checking whatever clues you have about wind direction down to the ground. What I, what I had on that one was I had sheets on a clothesline. And while I was at 400 feet, the sheets were blowing a certain way. And then I got a little lower and the sheets were hanging straight down and I didn't notice i didn't think that meant anything well that was the moment when the wind went the other way and as i got lower i'm now over to the field and i can't see the sheets on the clothesline anymore but so what would you do about that if you're if you're setting up your landing well 
One thing you could do, I had a big field. I could have come in crosswind and just looked for my drift. Am I drifting this way or am I drifting this way? And then just made my final turn one way or the other so that I was into wind, whatever direction the wind happened to be. I didn't do that, of course, but um, that's something I could have done that day that would have solved that problem. Carl. Yeah, so I, um, I put out a, a link to a video in the, in the chat there. I don't know if we've got the wherewithal to, to analyze that, but um, it was a collapse I took at um, Greylock a couple of years ago um, that surprised the hell out of me. Um, um, I'm not sure I reacted um, correctly, but um, luckily the wing did um, did what it needed to do. And um, so that, that saved me there. But um, <clears throat> you'd mentioned a couple of times about flying um, in Switzerland or in the Alps. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious what your what your guidance is there. I'm, I'm planning a trip to, uh, to Switzerland in uh, the end of August. And, um, um, Switzerland. Yeah. Okay. First of all, on the video, I'll, I'll be happy to look at it and write some notes and um, I'll send them to you and you can put them to the group in whatever form you like. Um, uh, Sw Switzerland in late August is likely to be strong midday. Um, mm -hmm. things, things to be particularly attentive to are phone winds or mm -hmm. fern winds, which we don't have anything like here and which are a very big deal. So if you're on a launch on what seems like a nice afternoon and there are no locals there, just mm -hmm. don't launch. <laughs> Go to a cafe because um, you're missing something and you don't know what it is. Um, is that when the, fern, when the friend usually turns on? Is his late afternoon? Is that? I, I'm, I've only flown a few trips in the Alps, so I'm not at all an expert. I think they can happen at, a, at different times, but probably early afternoon might be the, the most common, um, but I'm not sure. Ask, ask someone who knows about that, preferably a local. Um, we, we're gonna work with a local school when we get over there, so we should be perfect. Here. Okay, so you won't have to make that call. Um, uh, the, as, as far as the thermic turbulence, Switzerland can be really strong. And um, so try to fly in the roughest midday air you can find before that. And when you're there, try to avoid flying close to terrain. It's really tempting mm -hmm. to ridge run and you know fly pretty close to the ridges and things. Mm -hmm. I would just don't, just don't do that. Um, mm -hmm. um, you wanna have room to deal mm -hmm. with something or possibly throw your reserve. The other thing about flying in Switzerland, let's see. One thing is join Riga, R-I-G-A, before you go. It costs like, I don't know, 50 bucks a year. If you're a Riga member and you need a helicopter, it's free. If you're not mm -hmm. a Riga member and you need a helicopter, it's $10,000. Right. So, okay. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've uh, two uh, uh, answers or questions here uh, to throw in. One is regarding the, Carl, re regarding the flying in Switzerland and Föhn. Specifically, mm -hmm. food conditions. Um, I've learned uh, that the Swiss pilots <clears throat> they are checking the air pressure difference between airports north and south of the Alps, <clears throat> and if that pressure difference gets too big, then they essentially uh, call it off. And that mm -hmm. uh, those can be days that are beautiful blue sky, looking perfectly fine, and you can be thirty miles away from from the uh, uh, main line of the Alps and on the Northern side and flying and wondering why nobody's flying and everything is peachy. Mm. And um, uh, if it breaks through, then all hell breaks loose. And if it does, it doesn't. And, um, um, and uh, what the locals do is they check the pressure differences, but of course, how much between which airports mm. depends on where you are. Yeah. And that's okay. regarding specifically to fern days. Right. Uh, the, the other thing uh, I want to throw out uh, is that if, if I'm not performance flying, and I, I rarely am, I mean, I, I don't do comps and stuff, and I know that um, the air gets uh, rougher, and I, I want to um, um, uh, prevent collapses and other things of, uh, of, uh, from happening, uh, besides active flying, as James 
describes in great detail. Uh, one thing that I do quite often is I just turn tighter circles and load up the wing and pull a few Gs, uh, or not few Gs, but yeah, even half a G or one G more than regular makes mm. quite a difference in keeping your wing open. Mm. Um, essentially uh, less tight than I would turn in a strong thermal. Um, uh, I think at least doubles the pressure in my wing uh, to the point where it find, mm. feels quite solid in, in rowdy air. Mm. Um, and uh, you, you can make that even more dramatic if you practice it otherwise first. Um, and in some uh, so there, some places, for example, you know you, you have to go through shear layers or other kind of uh, little rowdy air to land. For example, when you fly Mount Washington up in New Hampshire, mm. the, um, uh, because the, the valley is narrow and um, uh, you essentially force into the single landing zone, which is a large field with trees around it. So the thing always pops off in the, uh, when you're landing mm. there. Mm. Um, uh, and it's but it's large. Uh, so uh, it's not a bad option to think about essentially spiraling down um, when it gets too rowdy. Uh, um, uh, I've rarely done that there, but it's always in the back of my mind. Uh, if, that, if this or that gets more bumpy, I might actually consider spiraling into it. Okay. Uh, we'll do milder versions of that. <clears throat> Great additions. Yeah. At Mount Washington, it's like um, the thermals were so weak and so rough. It's like, how does that even happen? <laughs> well, have you guys heard of a wind called um, Bise? B I S E? I heard it mentioned in the same paragraph as, as someone talking about Fern. <clears throat> um, it's, most it's of the great winds in the world, I don't, I don't know if I know that one, but um, most of the great winds like the Santa Ana's and California, mm -hmm. usually it's best not to fly when they're blowing. Um, yeah. uh, there's a, so here's something that's not exactly about active flying, but might be something you can use. Um, people talk about flying lee side and when is it safe to fly lee side? Is it ever safe to fly lee side? And um, I, I subscribe to Bruce Goldsmith's thinking about this, which is there are kind of four things to pay attention to. One is how strong is the wind that's blowing over the back? Obviously, if the wind is strong, that's worse than if the wind is weak. Um, how uh, strong is the sunshine? Um, if the sun's really strong, then you can fly lee side all day because the, the upslope from the from the sunshine in the summertime will, will overpower a week over the back wind. Um, the third is how big is the hill? And here's the strange thing and why I thought of it with the Alps. A big mountain, it's much safer to fly lee side than a 200 foot hill. Don't do it on a small hill in New England. Um, but in the Alps or uh, in the Owens or um, um, with, with big mountains uh, or at Marshall in California where you're on that side of the ridge and the Santa Ana's might be blowing down, um, that's a place where you can fly lee side if you have the other things working for you. And I'll review them in a second. There's one more that's, that people don't tend to think of, which is how stable is the day? And an, an unstable day is much safer to fly lee side than a stable day. And the reason is, if you think about some air blowing toward the ridge on the upwind side, and then it blows up the ridge and it gets to the top. Well, on the way up, it's been expanding and cooling and so on. If the temperature profile of the atmosphere is unstable, then that package of air, which is expanding at the dry adiabatic lapse rate, and cooling. Um, when it gets to the ridge height, it's not much, the, the temperature is not much different than the air around it. Contrast that with a stable day where the, the temperature profile in the atmosphere doesn't cool off so much with height. Now this parcel of air that we're blowing up the hill, it gets to the top, having cooled at the dry adiabatic lapse rate, and it's much colder. It may be many degrees colder than the air around it. The result is that coming down the backside, it tumbles like crazy. It really wants to fall. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the unstable day, it 
it doesn't do that. So the stability of the atmosphere is a crucial one. So um, I'll, I will dive into the Lee pretty strongly if I've got three of those on my side. So we've got the, the wind strength, the sunshine, the size of the mountain, and the stability of the day. If you don't have three, then you maybe want to ask yourself how, how your luck's been lately and if you've repacked your reserve. <laughs> Uh, does he cover those in his book there? there um, I think maybe in an appendix to the book or something like that. Okay. It strikes me as it might be in an appendix. Yeah. Not sure. Well, I'll make sense and well explained. Thanks, James. Anybody else got one? So we, we talked about keeping your hands moving as a training exercise. At some point, you won't need to anymore because you'll still be alive, but you'll probably find at that point, like I do now, if my hands are actually moving a little bit because I'm not holding them steady. We have a, a, a habit for whatever reason, at least a lot of us do, if, if we stop moving, then we our muscles stabilize in that place. And I'm sure there are activities that that's helpful for, but... Um, and in our evolution, but it's not helpful in paragliding. Getting stabilized means I'm not alive anymore to what's going on. And um, again, we want to be intentionally active. That means we want to be present and alive to everything that's happening with the glider. One thing I don't think I mentioned is on bar, you still have weight shift. And once again, when the glider asks you for something, give it to it and then come back to what you're doing. Um, and one thing, just since I'm thinking of it, since I'm thinking of gliding, when you're on glide, you'll notice that some people seem to glide like they just can find the line. Well, how do they do that? And you guys may know this, but no one taught me for a large part of my career. Um, if I'm on glide and I notice this riser lifts a little bit, well, that's trying to turn me this way, but I don't want to turn that way. I want to turn toward where the riser is lifting. So anytime a riser lifts, turn a little bit that way. This riser lifts, turn a little bit this way. Don't get stuck on flying straight. The riser is telling you something about where the lift your line is. Of course, if you're in a group, other people will tell you a lot about that. And in competitions, that can be really helpful. But just by paying attention to small movements of your risers, you can arrive at the next thermal 100 feet higher than your friends and they'll be mad at you later. Anybody else? Well, this has been fun. Thank you all for coming. And I will look at Carl's video and any others that might be in the chat. Hey, and, James? Uh, yes. Uh, before you. I, you know, talking about all this active piloting, I've been blown back over Mount Tom twice and blown back over West Rutland one time. So there's obviously a correlation in active piloting through all that. Um, you might comment on, you know, if that's, if that's an eventual event that you can't help but uh, know you're getting into a situation like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, um, if you're, that's one of the reasons to have your speed bar be like not something you even think about. You wanna to be totally comfortable with your speed bar, which means you need to use it all the time and not wait for an emergency. Um, competitions are helpful for that, of course, because you have to fly on full bar a lot to keep up. But um, um, so if you're getting blown back, then you're, um, your speed bar is the first resort. The second resort is, um, let, let's say this is a top view, let's say that's the ridge. If the wind's coming this way, it's anything but straight at the ridge, the wind's coming this way, then I wanna go that way. So I've got a little bit of crosswind component. I'm more likely to be able to get it back in front. If I try to go this way, I'm trying to go straight into the wind. And if it's too strong, I just won't be able to get there. But this gives me, I might end up a mile down there, but at least I'll be back in front of the ridge and I can land in front of the ridge. So 
paying attention to little bits of crosswind can make a big difference to getting out of trouble. Um, some places like Point of the Mountain, um, where on the north side, it's got a pretty steep ridge that drops off pretty steeply in the back. Um, an informal study of people getting blown back over the years uh, suggests that the people who, who reliably stayed out of the hospital were the ones who threw their reserve. Right. Because when you drop into that rotor, things get very wild and strong rotor. And um, no amount of active flying. I mean, you can fly very actively and you might get out of it and you might do the full combat thing and land and, and then you might think you're cool. And what you really should think is that you're lucky. Um, and so in, in a case like that, it, uh, unless you're really confident of your active flying, throwing your reserve, you know, while you're still high, so you're still near ridge height, while you're still high, look for a field, try to set yourself up so that your reserve drift is going to be into a decent place to land, taking the wind into account and as well as you can. Um, and then consider throwing your reserve rather than fighting it to the ground. Because if you take a big collapse at 100 feet, you're, you, you need a well-placed tree and you can't count on those. Good point. Did, did, did I answer your question, Pete? Yeah, no, you know, all the hand movements were thinking me, uh, you know, was trigger, triggering up those memories of those big hand moments <laughs> that I had. Uh, I landed each time successfully, but uh, okay. you know, big hand movements and active piloting. So you were, you, you just flew it to the ground and you needed big hand movements to do it. So that's a, that's nice work. Um, yeah. That's full combat to the ground. That's what we were talking about earlier. And if that's what it is, yeah, don't uh, never give up. Um, you might take a small collapse. Okay. Give it a pump, get it out and keep, keep at it. Cause that was it. That was it. Yeah. And until you've crashed, you haven't crashed and yeah. you don't, Never give up, never lose your attention, never say that did not just happen. Stay alive, <laughs> stay, stay on it. That's, yeah, so that's nice work. And that's active flying for sure. At, at its finest, maybe. Any other leftovers? Thank you. Yeah, hey James, this has been great. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot, James. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This is great. Appreciate it. The You're recording very welcome. will be uh, put up on the website. And uh, thanks everyone else for, for uh, all the good questions and attending. Yeah, thanks for coming. Awesome. Thank you, James. Thank, thank you. Very, yep, very thank good. you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Bye.